Hey everyone, this is Chris Keys for Premier Guitar hanging out in Nashville, Tennessee at the City Winery with Todd Rundgren. Todd, thank you so much for doing this. This is a special treat for not only myself, my father who's probably watching, and all the fans out there. So thank you very much. Hi kids. <laughs> <laughs> we have to talk about this one. This is a, I kind of alluded to before we started filming. This is kind of the guitar I've seen you the most with in terms of mm -hmm. recent, recent times. So you had a kind of a fun story about how you got this guitar and how it's become your number one. So unleash it. Uh, yeah, this is foamy. Um, all my guitars are usually named after what color they are or what kind of design they've got. So this one obviously is foam green, green and that's why we call them foamy. Um, I got foamy sometime in the late 80s when we were uh, touring J in Japan. Uh, in those days the uh, Japanese economy was so roaring along that anytime you toured in Japan, guitar manufacturers would show up at the gigs with four, six guitars and um, say pick one or pick a couple mm -hmm. just so long as we took pictures with them. And this was one of the guitars and I actually didn't play it at first. I just took it home and put it in storage with a bunch of other guitars that I had gotten over the years. And then a couple of years later I thought maybe I should check all those instruments out and see if one of them is one that I'd like to play and this one played the best and sounded the best and I've been using it pretty much on and off ever since. Um, I do switch out for other guitars every once in a while depending on what's apropos or sometimes just for looks. Yeah. You know, sometimes uh, like I have a, uh, a few guitars that fans have made for me that are very special instruments but don't sound the same mm. as this guitar so they don't make good spares. Um, but every once in a while if I'm doing a TV show or something like that, I'll get one of those out mm. and, uh, just so that it gets seen. Gotcha. And is there anything that you've done to it, you know, over the years that you've had it since you brought it out of the vault and started kind of making this the number one? Uh, I think we just got rid of the tone knob, you know, and just wired it on. I never really used it, yeah. so we just took it out and bypassed it. We also, I can't remember whether it originally had these switches, but I think they have probably been replaced at some point. Um, they're essentially polarity switches, okay. but I don't use them much either. Mm -hmm. I could take those out because yeah. I usually just keep it in that position. So it's really pretty much just the volume knob and the five position switch. And uh, tonally, what, you know, when you're going through all those guitars back in the 80s or eventually when you brought them back out, what did you hear or enjoy about this one compared to the other ones you had in the stash? Um, a lot of times guitars with this format and the single coil pickups don't have enough like juice, mm -hmm. you know, or they're noisy or something like that. And part of the reason was that it had a really good, good output, you know, it put out a nice signal so I didn't have to overcompensate for that. Um, pretty evenly sound, even sounding across the, um, the switch settings. In mm -hmm. other words, it doesn't get particularly loud or soft depending yeah. on the switch settings. It's evenly uh, tempered, I guess, in that sense. Um, still a bit bright when it's on the uh, neck pickup, um, which I sort of prefer. I don't really have a lot of songs that use, uh, you know, a, a muffy... A rounded tone, more rounded. Yeah, more rounded tone. I'm usually playing um, if I wanted that kind of tone, I would probably often just go with an acoustic sound yeah. or something like that. And uh, for strings, what do you typically use for strings and gauge or brand? Uh, gauge, I think we use the Dario's and uh, the gauge is a 10 and pretty much the, Standard the normal, normal cool. uh, set with a 10 on the top. Yeah. Cool. And or, in, or on the bottom, depending on how you think of the guitar. <laughs> yeah, what side, of the, <laughs> what side of the corner are we on? But, yeah. um, what tunings are you? What time? Uh, what tuning? I'm sorry. Is this one? It's just the regular tuning. Standard. I don't. Uh, I don't do much in terms of uh, drop tunings. This guitar it doesn't handle it. You know, it's we've got the fixed bridge yeah. on it. So, I mean, the fixed nut. So, it, if I break a string, it goes out of tune, and I have to get rid of it right away <laughs> for something a little bit more uh, conventional. 
Um, and what is that conventional guitar? You kind of were alluding to it before. Cam yeah, was that con more conventional guitar. That's Butters. Uh, that's <laughs> that's a great name. Uh, I was uh, doing a um, a tribute album to um, Robert Johnson. I actually it was part of a record deal that I made. I put an album out called Arena, which was a real guitar-oriented album. And the label that put it out said, we'll do that if you, we just acquired the, um, the songwriting catalog of Robert Johnson and we don't have a lot of licensable performances. So if you do an album of Robert Johnson covers, then we'll put them both out. And so for the Robert Johnson covers, I essentially, I'm not sure whether I used it on the record. I think I used a different telly on the record, but after I had done the record, I realized the telly was the right sound. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the uh, vintage guitar shop at the Guitar Center in San Francisco, I believe. And uh, they had a number of tellies, and I checked them all out, and this one, uh, was not the most expensive one, but it sounded the best to me. Had a little bit of cleanup work done on it, on the electronics yeah, on the inside. When there's the, some bad soldering. Uh, yeah, there was some <laughs> really ham-handed <laughs> wiring on the inside of the guitar. So we fixed that and the guitar just generally sounded better. There was intermittence and stuff like yeah. that with it. And so we had to open it up and that's when we discovered what a mess was in there. But fortunately it was all original equipment. It wasn't as if somebody had stuck some yeah. weird thing inside there that um, that would be atypical to the instrument. And uh, I can't remember if you said earlier what year that guitar is. I know you said 60s. It's in the 60s. I don't remember the exact gotcha. year, but it was not like one of the original 50s ones. Because it's but, pretty clean even for 60s. Uh, yeah, it m must have been sitting in some guy's closet or something like that, yeah. you know, until he finally uh, uh, put it up for sale. He probably put it in the closet after he had that bad wiring job. Uh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it is in remarkable shape. So it makes people think that it's a replica or, or something like that. Like a but or something. If you inspect it more carefully, you'll see it's all original equipment, and uh, and it does sound really terrific. It's a great sounding instrument. All right, this is the point where I'm going to start pepping you with questions. And obviously, you've heard these before, but we haven't had a chance to talk with you, Premier Guitar. So we're just going to start with the back the first one, uh, being the Fool SG. Uh, obviously you had it for a long time. Was there anything that you did to it to make it more your instrument or even just had to repair or just work out for your playing style or tone that you're chasing? Um, I didn't do anything to change the uh, basic tone of the instrument, okay. but when I got it, it was in just incredibly horrible shape. Yeah. Um, I got it from Jackie Lomax, who had been using it as a lap guitar. Um, it had a wooden bridge on it. Didn't have a conventional bridge. It had wow. a wooden bridge that they just stuck on it. Um, the uh, paint job had been pretty battered up, especially the back, because I think Eric wore like belt buckles yeah. sometimes and wore a lot of the paint off the back. Um, the back of the neck down by the head stock was all of the paint was gone from that. It had been all sweated off over the years and. Essentially, the wood was almost like balsa wood. It had been, it was all porous and eaten through. And shortly after I got the guitar, the headstock snapped off. So Oof. I had to have a new headstock made and grafted onto the end of the guitar. And I had the uh, paint job restored. And uh, the other funny thing was that they never put any sort of sealant on the the paint. paint job after they did it. Yeah. So it was still sort of tacky in a way, you know, bits of it were flaking off and it had this weird sort of slightly sticky feel to it. Um, as I recall, there was a matching bass that they made for Jack Bruce, but he stopped playing it fairly early on because they had painted the fingerboard as well. Mm -hmm. And he said it just felt too weird yeah, to play. So I had the paint job restored and then I had it sealed so that it would uh, remain restored. Yeah. And then uh, 
Uh, there may have been some missing knobs. There may have been a knob or two that was missing and we replaced them with just regular knobs. We didn't go to any trouble to find special knobs for it. And then I played it for decades yeah. after that. I owned the guitar longer than anyone else had owned it mm -hmm. and played it for longer than anyone else had played it. Uh, and then in the, in the, again in the, in the late 80s when I was in Japan, uh, a Japanese, I guess he was the luthier, but he, I think he was just more a guy who did finishes. He gave me a replica of it. I was going to ask if uh, you know whether it was uh, that time period or again, you know, even recently you said that you're out in the road with Utopia with the big stage show doing the whole kind of discography of your guys' work. I was wondering if you had a replica and kind of used I that to. I still do have the replica, that, yeah. yeah. And we call that, that? One, we call that one Sunny, and because uh, sunshine of your love. Yeah. Um, and that one does not sound the same. It sounds similar, but I believe that. Uh, they had taken some of the windings off of the original guitar, taking some of the windings off the pickup to mm -hmm. give it a sharper sound, off, out of, off of the bridge pickup. I'm not sure about the, uh, about the neck pickup, but it had a much more, more piercing sound than a stock instrument had, mm. um, which was one difference. Um, what did you like about the original when it became your guitar and you started using it and you got it fixed up, you got a real bridge on it? What did you like about it? Obviously, everyone associates that with the one well, tone in there, but what, what did you like about it for the stuff you were doing? I think quite obviously there was the history of it. Yeah, um, very important. Uh, also, in the, when I first started playing it in those days, anything that was a Fender-style guitar ran out at the 20th fret. Mm -hmm. You know, you couldn't get any higher than yeah. that, or at the 19th fret, or something like that. Some somewhere well short of where you could bend a full two octaves on the E. Mm -hmm. So I used that because I could play the full two octaves, yeah. you know, and also without any obstruction once you got up there. That was the great thing about those instruments is the entire neck is accessible whereas a, a lot of instruments as you get towards the top you've got to reach around yeah. the body of the guitar um, to get to the top frets so I uh, usually would use it in situations where I might be doing a lot of soloing mm -hmm. and stuff like that playing up near the top of the neck uh, but there was a period of time when I went completely the opposite direction there was one Fender guitar that did allow you to choke all the way up to two octaves, and that was a Mustang. Yeah, that's from the 70s. And I started playing Mustangs, both for that reason and because of the strange bridge design allowed you to do ridiculous things with it. And that's what I used when I played the solos on Bad Out of Hell and stuff like that, making all those motorcycle mm. noises and, and that sort of thing, all because of this guitar the way it was set up and the fact that it was a shortened scale, which was a problem because I have kind of fat fingers, Think, yeah. but you know, it was shortened scale made it hard to play chords up near the top, but it For could still solo. solo pretty well. And that was that black one? that you Yeah, the okay. black one. And we sort of put a, a conventional switch on it, you know, instead of the little slider Dials, switches yeah. at the top, got rid of those, put a more conventional switch on it. Um, not a whole lot of other customization. And, uh, and because it was such a short scale guitar, you know, if you pushed the tailpiece down like this, the strings just drooped, you yeah, know, it, yeah. it just went like that, you know. <laughs> so you get some ridiculous sounds that yeah. you couldn't get with a normal guitar. Um, ridiculously wide vibrato, you yeah. know, wee, 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 you know, that kind of thing, so. What about the glass guitar that you're using with, uh, the, I don't want to say it was like a Prince-like shape, but it had that, you had that, Design before see, that was ever adopted into his, uh, I guess, vernacular, if you would say, is that glass guitar they used with Utopia. Uh, that was aluminum. Aluminum, actually. okay. Yeah. The glass guitar was the song that we did <laughs> during the show. And we actually would cast a guitar out of ice every night and smash it on stage. Jeez. Um, but uh, that was a custom made, I had two of them, custom made Valeno guitars. Valeno is a, a luthier from Florida. I don't think he's alive anymore, so I don't think he makes any instruments anymore, but he was famous for making 
aluminum guitars. Mm -hmm. A lot, most of them with solid bodies, you know, and they weighed a ton. Yeah, you know, I imagine. The real neck ache, you know. <laughs> and the ones that he had made prior to that all looked pretty much like Stratocasters, I think, for the most part. But uh, we gave him the designs for the, the unk shaped guitar yeah. for, for me and a kind of the thing that was the opposite for the bass, you know, opposite shape. Yeah. And, um, and they were great instruments. They sounded really piercing, you know, they got really bright sound because it was all metal. Yeah. You know, solid aluminum neck. We had to put weights in the back end of the guitar because every time you would let go, it would just go like this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the neck weighed so, so much yeah, more than the body because the, the body dive. was actually hollow. Um, so, uh, we lost all of those guitars in a warehouse fire where, um, well, we lost the motorcycle drum kit that we used to have. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of touring artifacts all went up in a warehouse fire and all three of those instruments were lost. Wow. And when was that? How long ago was? Mm, early eighties, I oh, think, well, or mid eighties. Yeah, so yeah. And the, uh, another guitar I've seen you with, and this is more of a futuristic design, is that I know recently you're is, uh, with uh, Eastwood and Backland Design. Yeah. How did that guitar come about, and how do you, you know, use that, or tonally you jig about that? Well, the first thing I was looking for was something that looked cool. Yeah, you which know, that one does. Which it definitely does <laughs> look cool. You know, the Backland guitars are really fut futuristic designs, and since we're not going to have a whole lot of, you know, like hard production, you know, for the show, since it was a band retrospective and covering the entire career of the band, it's not like we were going to build a set around one phase because we went through so many different kind of um, changes. So I wanted something that looked futuristic, you know, go along with the kind of, you know, the kind of music and philosophy of the band. Mm -hmm. And someone suggested I check out the Backland line, and then I said, yeah, that's that's futuristic. Yeah. You know, it's what we call retro futuristic. You yeah. know, it's like what they thought the future would be like back in the fifties. It's like the Jetsons made a guitar for yeah, what they exactly, and put it in a time capsule, <laughs> and it came out. And remarkably, the the instrument sounded great too. It had a really good sound. Um, so I didn't mind playing them at all. And if you wanted to play those really high notes, they've got, I think, twenty four full frets maybe more than that it might yeah. be 26 full the frets the way that it's shaped it has it like you said yeah because it's got this swept thing on the bottom you know and then they put an extra kind of like the fingerboard at the top goes at an angle like this and so the extra frets are hanging off the bottom and you can't even see them <laughs> you know, they're there you have to sort you of feel, feel them, for yeah. them but you can't see them because the last fret when you're looking down on the guitar is somewhere around the 22nd fret, you know, but yeah. then those extra frets are all um, tacked on diagonally underneath it. So yeah, you can play some really squealing notes up there. Um, fun to play and, uh, and for what they deliver, it's actually a fairly reasonable instrument to own. Yeah, probably, like, yeah, I, I think I've seen it before they're about thirteen hundred yeah, to fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. You know, so. I, Todd, I'd be remiss if I didn't go in this ballpark. And it, you, know, you alluded to it. You did, you know, Bad Out of Hell with mm -hmm. Meatloaf. You did New York Dolls. What do you, as a guy that plays guitar, plays many different instruments? But to help our guys at home that might record or you know play live out, what kind of things do you know as a guitar player that you're always con conscious of when you're producing, and then vice versa as a producer, where the role of a guitar should fit or any trips trips any tricks or secrets that you've learned obviously over your huge impactful career well you know I've worked with uh, a number of guitar players and you could almost say that no two of them sound yeah the same in terms of you know how they like to hear their instruments and things like that um, but I often you know will try and encourage um, uh, guitarists to consider other options in terms of you know when when they're in the studio because you have the time to mess around and try other things you know whatever you may have be become comfortable with live 
may not translate the same way in the studio. Mm -hmm. So being open to trying a different amp or a different setup, something like that. Um, but you know, it's it's pretty much like almost any thing else when you're making a record you can't go in with a preconceived notion of how things work uh, I know producers that, who do but my uh, objectives in terms of the studio is not to be mucking around with sound all the time but making music mm -hmm. I know that other producers are very anal about it you know I've talked to Greg Hawks about what it was like making the first Cars record. Yeah. And he said, yeah, yeah, we spent a whole day just getting a rhythm guitar sound, you know, not actually recording the rhythm <laughs> guitar, just spending the entire day getting the sound for it, which meant they must have gone through dozens of instrument and amp combinations and that sort of thing. And while I think that there are times when that's justifiable, uh, my priorities have always been, you know, about the music, you know, is the music worth all this trouble in yeah. the first place, you know, and and so it's not necessarily the sound of uh, of somebody's instrument, but what they're playing on it, mm -hmm. you know, and that uh, will always get more attention from me than, than the sound. Uh, it, for instance, nowadays, it isn't even worth, you know, that kind of a struggle. When I did Bad Religion, we uh, we used guitar modeling on all the final sounds. In other words, the guitars were recorded with nothing on them. And what uh, to give people a reference, because there's Bad Religion fans out there for sure, is what rec record did you produce with that so they can go back and listen to it? Uh, it was called New America, I and believe. And so then they can, you know, take their tube amp snobbery somewhere else. Uh, yeah, well, there's, you know, <laughs> the, they didn't have any sort of tube amp snobbery, you know, and felt that, you know, having the flexibility to be able to change the sound later was preferable to spending a lot of time just kind of fiddling with sounds and then locking them in and then maybe discovering later that you wanted something different, you know. And, uh, and if you sort of print the, you know, the distortion and other sorts of things, you can't have less distortion later, yeah. you know. You're gonna have to either make it more distorted or or uh, or reperform it, you yeah. Know? And so uh, I've been into the modeling thing ever since. Well, the first time I experienced it was a band called Twelve Rods. They're not around anymore. They didn't get past their second record, I don't think. Mm. But uh, great band, though, really terrific band. And both the guitar players used um, Line Six modeling amps that were called Tube Tone amps at that time, and. Uh, and the brand was Axe, Axe 212, later became Line 6. Mm. Um, and I still have that amp, and that's like my favorite amp, and I don't take that out on the road really? ever, a anywhere. But I still use Line 6 stuff. I use a Line 6 HDX um, yeah, that's the rack mount thing. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Was no, there's no sounds in that. That's just the, uh, the pedal. I don't do a lot of banking. I have like four basic sounds I use most of the time. I don't even have the pedal connected, you know, because <laughs> I, I, if I do, I will accidentally hit it and yeah. turn my guitar off. So, uh, so it's really just the four switches that is the only thing I need. And, um, and it's the first time I've used that particular thing. I've used various kinds of Line 6 mm -hmm. equipment. Uh, my favorite will always be the Axe 212, but the new HD line got, I got a lot of bang out of that particular box. And considering how many sounds um, I could have gotten out yeah. of it, you know, I, uh, I still haven't really gotten to, the, um, gotten to the bottom of what's possible. Yeah, so it sounds like you're pretty open to technology kind of helping artists and musicians get out there and get out of their way in terms of like chasing tone, you know, it's always a kind of a battle between all of us that we have conversations with. Is either you know tubes and pedals, or is it modeling, whether it's fractal or line six? You kind of just let it work and let the well. Music again, stand. it's like it, it. Sometimes the you know the whole equipment thing is a way to it becomes like a crutch. Um, I know that there were, I went through a long period as a guitar player where if I didn't have the proper sustaining grit on the guitar, I couldn't play. Yeah, you know, 
if it just sounded like a, a guitar plugged into a Fender amp, I couldn't play. You know, it's just, it just sounded awful to mm -hmm. me. Um, but then you have to realize that, you know, my, you know, like my guitar heroes, they don't have that problem. Eric Clapton has changed his sound over the years and, and uh, you know, went from the original sort of Gibson, real thick sound to, um, to a Stratocaster sound, which mm -hmm. is a, just a completely different kind of yeah. sound. And, uh, and I imagine that you could hand him any instrument and any instrument amp combination or acoustic guitar or a crappy old um, dobro or yeah. something like that and he would just attack it, he would play it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, most real guitar players, that's how they feel about the, uh, about the instrument. They might have a favorite, but if you can't play without that favorite guitar, it's kind of limiting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it restricts, you know, kind of their almost thought process musically in a way that you know, they're kind of hung up on it. Yeah, and I don't, f I don't feel as self-conscious now about, you know, the sound aspect of it. I don't mind getting on stage with a crappy guitar sound. It's just the worst part is like when you get invited to jam and you can't hear yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a couple of disastrous moments at Montreux, you know, where, you know, I'm sitting in with B.B. King and, and George Duke and a whole bunch of... and Pine Top Perkins, I think, you know, and my amp is somewhere over there under the organ and Pine Top Perkins amp is behind my head, you know, that's, <laughs> I can't that's all hear, you get. and I can't hear a thing I'm playing. So, um, and so uh, it could have been really horrible. I have no idea, you know, but I kind of, I'm a little bit more wary now about those situations, yeah. you know, where you get invited to do something, but uh, you may discover once you're up there, you wish you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, and because uh, you've had such a long career, I, I just curious to know that you, are you still as passionate about music and producing as you were back in the '60s and '70s and when you're starting? Because you've put out almost 30 records. Just put one out last year. Mm -hmm. with, you collaborated with uh, Trent Reznor, which is obviously you know, which is just great. You're just able to move along through decade to decade, and you're just still re as relevant as you were in '72. Well, it's taken some adaptation to the way that the music business has changed. Yeah. I don't get hardly any production offers anymore. The whole economics of that has changed. The whole, the f whole philosophy of it has changed in a way. I mean, when you look at modern records, you see they've got like every song's got five songwriters and three producers yeah. on it, you know, so it's uh, a completely different thing but I have found sort of new inspiration in this collaboration thing which is something that wasn't as possible let's say back in the 90s when things started to collapse but now mm -hmm. that we've got you know file sharing services and things like that it makes it much more convenient to do that sort of thing and so I've started to focus more on that what are the things that I can do with other people and trying to connect with artists that I admired but maybe never had a chance to work with or um, who I think could use the kind of shot in the arm that a, a collaboration can sometimes provide, you know, when people forget your name and forget mm -hmm. you're out there and then you suddenly do something with someone else that results in an interesting new musical combination that sheds light on you and that's part of the reason why I like to do the collaborations mm -hmm. is it builds audience for everybody involved. What do you enjoy out of the excitement because I imagine when you first started collaborating and being in bands as a, young, as a youngster is that you like being in a room with five or six guys and you just hammered out some songs or in your case I know that you started out doing a lot of the instrumentation yourself mm -hmm. but the collaboration of being in a couple guys in a room or in a tour bus thinking of new ideas whereas now you're still having that collaboration but it's like you said, through Dropbox or mm -hmm. file sharing services. Is that exciting where you get someone sends you a new file and you're like, oh, what can we do with this? Or, yeah. Uh, it is. It's a yeah. whole different way of doing it, but it's still I know, there. but that's kind of the great part of, about it. You mentioned Trent Reznor. Uh, you know, I asked him if he wanted to collaborate on something. He said, sure. He sent me uh, an entire album's worth of ideas. <laughs> because he and his partner Atticus Ross do a lot of soundtrack work yeah. and so they collect libraries of ideas and he just gave me a big chunk of that library and said okay pick one and I had the hardest biggest problem was trying to figure out which one to do 
the same thing with, uh, I, I'm doing a collab with Rivers Cuomo. He sent me like 20 ideas. Steve Vai sent me at least two dozen ideas. Uh, uh, trying to figure out which one we want to focus on yeah. is the biggest challenge in some ways. But in, in, in that regard, you get to, you know, it's kind of exciting, I imagine, to open that file or daunting where you see all those files and you're like, oh boy, which one do I got to pick? But I know, it's an um, embarrassment of riches often, you know, and the hardest thing is say, well, I want to do that. No, I want to do that. No, I want to do that one. Or, you know, uh, I'm actually, you know, in, in case of Rivers Cuomo, I'm working on three different ideas. Oh, cool. Which, you know, I may use one i may return one to him i may give we may give it to somebody else altogether yeah. you know so um there's no shortage of music out there to be made and that's kind of you know what the fun is if i continue doing what i was doing which is making my albums myself in my little room in Kauai because it's too much trouble to fly people over mm -hmm. and I, i'm in kind of an echo chamber and i don't get these fresh new ideas and the, and in the way that I do now when somebody sends me just a giant pile of stuff or even just one thing yeah. or even just consents to the idea of doing a collaboration then it gives me ideas um, and often you know what they send me when I put fresh ears to it it turns into something completely different you know I'll I'll hear the what they think is a chorus and it's a verse to me you huh. know and the versus a bridge, you know, and it needs a new chorus or we'll build a chorus out of this sort of stuff. So um, the things almost never come out exactly as they're originally imagined, yeah. you know, and it's, yeah, it's fun to take somebody's idea that they've sort of exhausted themselves on and can't finish mm -hmm. and then suddenly fresh ears take it in a whole new direction and the next thing you know, you got a song. Todd, I'm, we're going to talk to the rest of your band, but I appreciate your time. Cool. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right, back here now in the base area with Chasm. Chasm, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Very well. Thank you so much. You've already alluded to, before we started rolling cameras, that you have a very lean setup, but still worthy. So thank you so much for talking to Absolutely. us about your Absolutely. Thanks base. for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. What's this five string all about? Tell us. Um, you know, I, 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 I know so many people that say five strings, you don't need it. Um, and for the most part, I, I, I subscribe to that. I have um, a signature bass that's made by Archer Guitars okay. uh, out of Wisconsin. Um, unfortunately, that, that's a four string. So, but for this particular, um, for this configuration with the, in this particular show, uh, I find that the extra string just gives it a little bit more a little bit more meat, a yeah, little bit more beef. low end, you know. Um, if I was in a bigger band, uh, I probably wouldn't need it, but with a, with a four-piece band like this, it, it, it definitely comes in handy. Cool. And uh, what actual bass is this one that you're using this is an uh, This is an Ibanez. Oh, right. um, I just started playing these basses over the last year. Um, what, was, what happened was I used to, uh, I'm, uh, I, I have Spectres, and uh, I've been using Spectres for probably 30 years or so. Um, and I have, a, I have a bunch of them at home, uh, and I had a Spectre five string that's one of my favorite basses. Um, I don't, I'm not sure the model number. Um, Stuart makes some mean basses. Stuart makes great basses. He makes really, really good instruments. Um, but they, it, it weighs a ton. <laughs> and I, I mean, when I say it weighs a ton, it's probably about maybe seven pounds or something like that, six and a half mm -hmm. pounds or something like that. And uh, in a two hour show, wearing a six and a half pound bass or yeah. a six pound bass, it, it definitely gets to you. It was pinching my, my arm and I was having. I was experiencing tennis elbow, uh, tennis elbow pay, playing the bass. <laughs> so uh, we were in Florida. Uh, it was on the uh, the Todd tour, um, White Night, the White Night tour, and it was a two-hour show. And I just couldn't, I couldn't do another show with the bass on it. So I just, I got in a taxi cab. I went to the nearest guitar center, oh, wow. and I just, said, I looked around and I was like, "What could I possibly get?" You need a five string. <laughs> I, I, I needed a five string for that show. That's that it. show required a five string, and um, and I saw this, uh, not this one, <clears throat> um, but a mahogany, a, a complete mahogany one of the same model. Um, this is a. 
don't even know the model of it. This is an SR675. Just rolls uh, off the tongue. Yeah, and uh, and I just picked it up and it, 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 it was nice and light and kind of my, my bass style. Uh, this is very similar to, to my signature okay. instrument, uh, Casm Sultan bass. Um, and it was under $700 and I just plopped down a credit card, bought it, and I've been using these ever since. This is the second one that I have. All right. This one was, uh, they just started making this color, which is the black finish with, uh, with a little white grain yeah, in I it. Yeah, I like that. It really um, makes that pop. And this was, the, this was their NAM uh, display model. Huh. And I called a couple of friends because I was looking for it. I was looking for a black one. I didn't like the brown base. I, most guitars, I have a black. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, called a couple of buddies uh, in the business, and they, they sold me this one. So uh, I have this one and another one at home. Um, but for the most part, uh, when I'm home recording, I use uh, my K-Bass or one of my Fenders or something like that. And is, have you done anything to make this more suitable for what you're looking for? Or do you mm -hmm. have with the Bartolini's, or is that what came with it? Uh, this is completely stock. Oh, all There's right. There's nothing. The only thing that I don't particularly like about this guitar is the truss rod adjustment is in, is in here. Uh -huh. So you have to have um, the, the Allen wrench and then, you know, move the strings, loosen the strings to, a, to a, make any adjustment yeah. on the neck, which is a drag. The other one, the brown one that I have, the one that's all mahogany, is um, the, the, uh, the truss rod adjustment is up here on the headstock with a little flip, uh, little flip plastic door. That's a brilliant design because you don't have to take the, the plate off. You don't have to take the oh, truss rod yeah. plate off. It just has a little, a little notch on it. You just flip it down and you can access the, uh, the truss rod right from there. I like truss rod adjustments up here as opposed to yeah. down here, like on, on fenders and stuff like that. And uh, for strings, what are you using? These actually are, th that's very interesting that you ask because I have been using elixirs for the past 30 years. I love elixir strings. They're, they're, uh, they make a great string. They last for a long time. And the beauty of the elixir strings, they're coated. Mm. They had, I don't know if they still make two coatings, but they, they, did, uh, make two, uh, they did make two coatings for bass strings, polyweb and nanoweb. I was going to say the nanoweb, I know. Don't me. ask me the difference between <laughs> no, poly, poly I've and known, nano. I've, I've used the one nanoweb myself. Um, the only thing with the elixir <laughs> is that... Um, the uh, the B string, the low B string, they make a uh, a 130 is the highest that they make, is the biggest string that mm -hmm. they make. So um, when we did the Utopia tour uh, earlier this year in a uh, April, uh, May, and June, um, the guitar tech who was teching for myself and Todd, uh, Doug Red uh, Redler, um, <clears throat> suggested that I try a set of DRs out. I love the DRs. These are these are really good strings, and this this B is a 135. You like that extra? I like that extra because what happens is with the 130, the string ten tension between he, the the nut and the bridge, um, it tends to because the string is so low, it tends to get a little floppy. Mm -hmm. But if there's a little bit more girth to the string, yeah, um, when you when you tighten it up to a B, it has a little bit more. Um, it fights back a little bit more, which I particularly mm -hmm. like. And is this a custom set, or is this just no? Like this off is the a rack? DR That's off the just, rack. Okay. They're, they're heavy, the heaviest set that they make, I believe, it's a 135 to a 50. Okay, cool. And picks, or are you normally just running your hands? Or do um, you normally, I run my hands, but uh, for the most part, I use a Dunlop, um, uh, a Dunlop 73 uh, black uh, pick. This is my Utopia pick. Um, That's a pretty uh, thin pick. What do you like about that? It really has some flexibility with being a 733. Um, 730, because when, when you're playing, when you're playing bass, um, you don't want a pick that gives too much for mm. me. Um, uh, this is this is a uh, like a heavy medium. Uh, I guess you would consider that a medium. I don't know what. Would yeah. You? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and I There's tend some flex. to. Yeah, and I tend to hold it as close to the uh, as close to the point as possible because I don't. I always oh, if muting. I'm using a pick, um, you're I'm muting. usually I'm yeah. not, I'm not yeah. that kind of player. You're not letting I'll, it ring. 
I'll, I'll use my palm uh, or the, the butt side of my hand mm -hmm. and because uh, that's the whole idea about it. For, for me with a pick, it's muting yeah. and, uh, and, and attack. Yeah. And it's all about dynamics because all we're running here is this uh, EA amp behind us. Yeah, well, that's um, I've been using uh, uh, Euphonic Audio amps for, again, uh, probably about maybe 25 years. This is, to me personally, uh, these amplifiers are the best amplifiers on the market. Um, <coughs> the company's been around since the early 90s. Um, I met them at a NAMM show, tried the amp. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's the cleanest, um, purest bass sound that, uh, that I've heard from an amplifier. This little amp with uh, two 12s, uh, two mid-range speakers, and a, and a tweeter is uh, as loud, if not louder, than an SVT. Dang. Um, That's and, saying something. <laughs> yeah, they, they just make a, a, a really, really uh, efficient... Um, cabinet and the uh, the solid state head I'm not crazy about solid state but uh, these days taking tube amps on the road it's just you know it, unreliable back. unreliable you got to change tubes yeah and uh, you never know when it's gonna blow up yeah this head's been knocked around dropped kicked uh, yeah, fell off a bridge. Are you trying once. to break it? No, I wasn't <laughs> trying to but uh, it's just got the it's got the cleanest sound you know uh, and I know that you've, uh, that you've interviewed Todd and you're about to interview yeah. Jesse Gress. Um, these guys tend to have uh, a lot of effects on their rigs. Mm -hmm. And as a bass player, um, I've used effects in the past. Uh, I, I, I don't shy away from using them, but the more effects that the guitar players use, the less effects I can use. Yeah, I was going to ask, what do you see your role in this current configuration? Because you've obviously alluded to other tools you've done with Todd. But currently with the four-piece, what do you see your role being the bass player tonally? Because obviously said they kind of, the more they got, which Jesse has a nice pedal board we'll get yeah. to, is uh, what's your role within the band and what dynamically you can do with just amp and your preamp. You know, the, the, the point for me is to not get away, in the way of them, mm. is, uh, is to not um, battle with them as far as effects, sound. Um, they uh, both Todd and Jesse tend to have um, a little bit of a mid-rangey sound, mm -hmm. which is good for me yeah. because um, I can get underneath them and, uh, and, and give the support to their guitar sounds that make more sense than, than me having like a, a, a flange or a chorus yeah. or a, uh, an octave divider or um, even compression or EQ. I don't necessarily find that, um, that that's needed in, in these situations where both guitar players are using a lot of effects. Mm -hmm. And especially because we have a keyboard player too. You know. So they, so you're providing the foundation. Yeah, like for instance, um, I used to play with Joan Jett. I played with Joan from 1987 to 1990, and uh, uh, at that time I, I had an ESP bass, um, and it was just off the shelf. Um, and it, it had active EMG pickups in it, um, but it was, uh, it must have weighed about three pounds. It was like made out of balsa wood or <laughs> something. Like it was like the most ridiculously light bass that I, I still have it actually. Um, and it sounded horrible. It was a horrible sounding bass. It was nothing but mid-range for some reason. But in the, uh, in the context of Joan and the guitar player Ricky Bird, uh, um, and it was, that was just a, two guitars, bass, and drums. Yeah. Um, that bass worked perfectly because their guitar sounds were, were here and here. You know, lots of low end, lots of high end, nothing in the middle. You got so much room to play with. Yeah, so I went right for the middle, you know, and, and it worked out good with that bass. I've never used that bass again. <laughs> it wouldn't work on any other gig, but for Joan, um, that, was, that was the perfect bass. So this one is good because it's got a lot, it, there's, there's not a lot of mid-range in this bass. There's a lot of, a lot of high end and a lot of, uh, a lot of low end. Yeah, I can feel it. 
Uh, and then, you know, sometimes if I ever, um, the, the, this is a pretty cool feature of this bass. Um, it's got this mid-range boost here. And a selectable switch. Don't ask me where the, the selections are. <laughs> I don't know. But um, every once in a while we do a song called um, uh, Born to Synthesize and there's, uh, everybody gets, gets a solo in it and I just crank up the, uh, the mid-range. <laughs> Whatever, whatever the hall calls for. Yeah. And it gets a little gritty. Yeah. So you're finding pretty much all your dynamics through, are you messing with the controls a lot through a set or is it kind of just your attack? It's, it, you know, I'm a firm believer in, um, you can put all the, the preamps and, uh, and cabinets and, uh, you know, and pedals and compression and EQ uh, and effects that you want, but it comes from here first, right? It, it comes from here. Yeah. And, uh, and the string and the pickup. So I rely really on uh, on my fingers and mm. uh, and the the actual instrument for dynamics and uh, and sound for that matter. Typical question I don't normally ask, but it, it's come up in my mind is is since they're so important to your tone and your gig right now is is there anything special that you would like to tell other bassists that you take care of your hands or anything that you do maybe out of the ordinary that to keep you know they're your tools. You know it's funny because. Um, I mean, I've been doing this now professionally for 42 years, um, and a lot of uh, a lot of my peers, a lot of people that I know, a lot of bass players that I speak to say my fingers hurt. Um, I, you know, I have a little bit of arthritis yeah. in my hands. Uh, I'm uh, I'm looking at carpal tunnel. I got to go to the doctor. I got to for thank. The good Lord, whoever you want to call, however you want to look at it, the, the, the person, the higher power or whatever, I have not had any problems with my fingers or my hands. With some wood. Just that uh, tennis yeah. elbow you had from that big yeah. bass. Yeah, and, that you know, and that's, th that's dealable because that's right. I, I, had, it, um, I had a cortisone shot uh, once, and you're not supposed to get cortisone shots for it. It's just really bad for yeah. you. Um, and it ha and ever since I've lightened the load on my base, um, uh, on my shoulder, uh, it hasn't bothered me. The other thing that um, I used to always use is a thin strap. Uh. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, it's like all these things, they really, they work in conjunction together. And so the minute I went to a three inch strap, uh, a, little it, it, a little more distribution, a little more disbursement of the weight. Uh, and a little less digging into that muscle up here, mm -hmm. or just above the collarbone, uh, that tends to pinch. You know, the the more that you, the, the longer you wear the base, yeah. and uh, you know, the uh, it's, uh, it, it's just more comfortable for me to have a thicker strap or a wider strap. The other thing too um, is uh, I, I don't like a lot of guys. Um, tend to wear the base a little low. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. Uh, I, I don't subscribe to that. I like to wear it right, right mid waist. Like if if you, if you looked at where the the middle of this this base is right here, from the center of the the neck all the way down to the bridge, that sits right on my right on my belly, mm -hmm. right just below. Kind of like a natural. Yeah, it's right there. A lot of guys like it down here. Um, I used to work with T-Bone Walk who was one of the best bass, bass players in the world. Um, and he used to keep his bass up here, <laughs> you know. Uh, there's a lot of guys that do that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but for me, right here is where it's most comfortable and that's, that's how I like it. Works for you. Who's to say it shouldn't? Well, it's all subjective, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, right? It's whatever Everything works is. for you. Everything we were talking about is. I think we're gonna have time left for just Jesse, so okay. thank you so Great. much. Thank you so much for speaking. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks thank for having you. me on, guys. See you soon. All right, last but definitely not least, Jesse. Jesse, how you doing? Doing pretty good. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this before the show. And uh, oh, no worries. Got traditional pedal boards, so we feel at home here. <laughs> got the analog stuff. So, but let's start with the guitar. Finally, pedals. Oh, the guitar. <laughs> this is pretty much my main 
thing. I kind of bled all over it the other night. Oh, man. <laughs> Do a little decoupage and leave it on there until it wears <laughs> off. But uh, I'm supposed to say it's a Fender because it's all Fender parts, but the body actually came from Gary Brower's shop in San Francisco. Oh, wow. And Gary had a friend that worked in a marbleizing uh, plant and had some pictures of these bodies. So I just gave him the colors that I would like. And, and he came out with this beautiful thing yeah, here. It's, beautiful. it's, uh, um, it's called marbleizing, I guess. It's some sort of drag the paint technique. You see it on stationary borders and yeah. toilet paper wrappers in hotels. <laughs> <laughs> and all the other parts were given to me by Fender. It's a back neck, old back neck, really fat, right off the assembly line. And the pickups are lace sensors, which I think I got a blue one here and two silvers which I don't really like on any other guitar, but I'm just so afraid to do anything to this guitar that, that it'll change it somehow for the worse. How so long I've, has this been your baby? I think I put it, I got it with a different neck originally in about 91. Okay. And I probably got the Beck neck by about 92 or three. And so it's almost broken in. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting Maybe there. a few more years. <laughs> it's getting lighter, lighter weight. But it's, you know, it's pretty much uh, stock wiring, except Gary put in a, a pull switch, which I took the knob off of because the knob kept coming off, <laughs> which activates the neck pickup so I can get the extra combinations All right. between, you know, just the five, the five usuals. But now down in this position, pull that out and I've got neck and bridge. Tell you, you kind of have to crank it to hear it. But it's a good jangly sound for a lot of stuff. For that kind of stuff, a little... You know, big difference. Between, just makes it a little more piercing. And then, of course, you can get all three pickups with that combination. Is there because you got these two, and then that one with that out activates that. So. Wrong sound for that song. <laughs> is, there, is there a spot that you ride in, or is it all throughout the night you're changing, or is there a setting that you kind of I'm go always the on it here. I, I try to get back to that old school thing of finding the sweet spot around seven uh -huh. on the volume control and having a little bit of headroom, but more often than not, it's just I look down, oh shit. I'm on and time. then what about pickup selection uh, in terms of, is there one that you kind of bridge, or is it uh, neck and middle? This has a really good neck sound. Oh. You know, very. Very nice fendery sound there, and the and the bridge pickup's pretty sweet too. Um, more for gainy stuff. Let's click on the clon here. Gives you some nice uh, a nice lead sound for that. Uh, what strings you got on this bad boy? Uh, right there, any oh, right. tins, yeah. Yeah. Ernie Ball 10s? Tony Levin hooked me up years ago, and they've been sending me strings ever since, so. And gotta ask, is there any reason or rhyme that you do that, or you just have time to cut them off? Um, the I don't like getting stuck by the cutoff string. Yeah. <laughs> In the heat of battle sometimes, maybe Randy will be busy, I might break a string and have to do it myself, and, and just, if you got that little needle there, I just, I can't deal with that, so. I don't care. It's messy. I know yeah. some people oh, think no. it's a horrible thing, but just didn't know if there's any. Got the shallower locking tuners. Got a. This is a, a different roller nut that Fender came out with. It has a little ball bearings in it, as opposed to the one that's got the rods going through it that Jeff Beck actually uses. Mm -hmm. And I think the one he uses has better um, sustain to it because in that. Yeah. You know, it's a, whoops. Where are we at? You can get that, but I can't get that 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 mm. last one, man. There's just I don't know. It just it just doesn't want to come out. All the others will come out fine. I do a lot with harmonics. What do you like about the, the ball bearings? And obviously, it doesn't have to sustain. But what do you like tuning stable? Um, I it mainly it keep it maintains my secret D note. I call it. It's up here. It's the G string between the nut and the tuning peg. There it is, secret D. Secret. And I can use it in chords. You know, I can use it for 
make crazy siren sounds with it. <laughs> if you mute the string down here, you don't get it. So it's actually sympathetically vibrating the G string. You can hear the G in there. There's like yeah. a G and a D in there. But the other uh, nut, that was like an E flat or somewhere in between. <laughs> so it's a trade off just for that. Cool. And then you have a. Uh, uh Line six, Variax. Um, yeah, I got a, a Variax. It's a James Tyler one from maybe, I think I was given that in about uh, 2013 when we did the state tour, which was completely no pedals. Uh, well, I wouldn't say no pedals, but no, no analog pedals, no amps. Everything was through in ears or head. I wore headphones for it. And uh, for that, I used a, a, a Line six floor pod, kind of an early thing that still had knobs on it. Mm -hmm and the uh, HD 500, I think. So it was a combination of those two things, going out in stereo and, you know, not my favorite sounds, just to sit around and play with. Yeah. And, and, and all that programming drives me a little nuts. Um, I just don't, I'm not really into the scenes, you know, each, each sound is like a scene. Yeah. And then you, things don't respond quite the same way when you're dealing with your volume and tone controls. So anyway, um, that's a great guitar. It hardly ever goes out of tune. It's gotten me through some tough spots. I mainly just use it as a spare now, okay. but um, we did, a, right, be right before the Utopia tour that Todd just did, Chasm put together a band to play um, a lot of tunes he did with Utopia and called it, with Todd's blessing, Chasm Sultan's Utopia. And we did three gigs and then Todd said, oh yeah, Utopia's gonna tour, so. You know, that <laughs> kind of overshadows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That yeah. Went, that's on hold for now. We'll probably do more with that. But anyway, he wanted to do all the songs tuned down a half step. So I didn't want to, you know, re have to redo this because the, the way Gary Brower set up this bridge is so great. This guitar hardly ever goes out of tune um, because it's set to, so the bar actually brings it back in tune instead of Yeah, I can it see out. how it's sitting. If I start bending strings really far and watch wow. <laughs> it's the tune-up bar <laughs> so it, it actually brings it back so when I'm playing a lot of bendy shit and stuff I'm I'm adjusting to the guitar being a little out of tune and then I just whack it to get back in tune so you chords. know this like the back of your hand this guitar yeah pretty I have a sort of elaborate way of putting the strings on and stretching all the life out of them initially but then it, it just stays for a while it's like I can do a lot of crazy stuff on it if I want and it, it, it stays very stable so uh, cool well the next that's thing that's Gary's thing with the bridge here this is my daughter's name on the back here so I can hold it up when we're doing TV shows or something that's cool Dee, my stepdaughter my beautiful stepdaughter but uh, he's got three springs he used to have two kind of fanned out and the last time I took it in he set it up this way did he say why he switched it uh, I don't remember he's just messing around said it worked better yeah. so and it's set to float so you know you're you can do manual chorusing you know just by pounding on the bridge it's like a little manual vibrato yeah. um, you know you got that thing that a lot of players don't like where you bend a string here and the low E string takes a dive you know but you can play shit like <laughs> just by bending the wrong string and hitting the low E string you know half the magic is how Gary has this thing set up too yeah. it's about a minor third on the uh, G string so it's gonna pretty much stay in tune there Anywho, before we get the tonal equation going here so people can see it, is that you're actually using this front DeVille as a baffle for the back DeVille. Yeah, we, um, we had some plexiglass baffles that weren't ours that we're using. This is a quieter show. It's not a quiet show, but it's a quieter show than, than some of the full production things that we do. Um, so there's always like the issue of me being a little loud on stage. Um, I've really come to like these DeVille amps I'm a 4x10 guy, that's the one I own at home, but mistakenly uh, a 2x12 was sent out and uh, actually two 2x12s and the guy that we rented them from uh, actually brought uh, the, the 410s along later and we swapped just one because I noticed that the 212 had a really kind of airier 
brighter sound to it that was working pretty good hmm. with this show. Um, so anyway, uh, we're, we're, we're stuck without the baffles at one show, and I said, why don't we just put the amp, I'm not the spare amp, in front and mic up the back amp, and been doing that, and it's, it's working. Cool. It works. Let's dive right into your pedal board. Ah! <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, this should be called <clears throat> Rundown Rig, maybe, instead of Rig Rundown. But like Perry said before, <laughs> you've got a clon, so I don't know how much Rundown it, it is, but you said you've had that for a long time. Yeah, I, I love my Klon. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do when it breaks. There's actually good clones out there. Yeah. The one I really like is the J Rocket uh, Archer. Archer, pedal. they have the Archer. That's they have the really, icon. really close. In fact, he made a second one called the Archer Icon, icon. Yep. that made, he painted it gold and supposedly got the same key ingredients to it as this. But I, like the sil I think the silver one responds more like this one. That's just the way it feels to me. Well, so, take, take us through your setup and kind of how setup, you use it for well, the night. Let's see. I run into this. Well, yeah, everything is mounted on this piece of plywood here that's covered in Velcro stuff, so it's not going anywhere. And I'll run some stuff into the front end depending on what gig we're doing. In this case, it's a POG 2 to get some more keyboard like textures. And once in a while, I also have a great fuzz tone that I got called the Bloody Finger. Have you heard of the Bloody Finger? <laughs> I think a Dave Anderson or Henderson, he was at a gig the other night. I didn't bring it out on the tour and I felt bad. <laughs> but it's usually there. It's called the bloody finger because it's all like shiny plexiglass with real sharp edges. So you have to be careful how you yeah. actually handle the thing or you get a bloody, a damn bloody finger. Um, oh, picks wise, we never talked about oh, yeah. picks. That's my little Jim Dunlop, Jazz 3s. Little guys. Preferred pick, yeah. I, I'll use one or two for an entire tour. <laughs> People say, hey, can I have a pick? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're well, honest. Well, okay then, no. Um, Go to your store. So anyway, there's an AB, you know, whatever I'm running into the front here, which I'll show you what that thing does in a second, but just as far as the chain goes, I'm running into there. That goes into an AB box simply so I can tune silently. Mm -hmm. uh, so one goes to the antique tuner there. And I think we continue to this old MXR Dynacomp compressor. I think it comes out of the compressor, goes into the rat. I think the rat, where does the rat go? I think the rat goes into this Hermita Zen drive, which I'll use only as a, a boost. Sometimes I'll use it if the amp's a little anemic, just as a clean boost. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't use it as an overdrive. So I'll just, just that much difference. If I want to kick it up for a clean solo, like uh, we're playing, uh, we do a bossa nova version of I Saw the Light in this, <laughs> in this thing and I play the solo. So if I'm going from, gives me enough to get heard over because you know it's supposed to be quiet bossa nova but we band gets a little rambunctious sometimes so <laughs> you got to do that uh from there i think we're going into the clon the, the routing was probably a real estate choice as much as anything else mm -hmm. and it, it, it ended up sounding okay to me this way but maybe it's not the proper way to do it and maybe all three overdrives should be together or something or do you ever stack them you know, like using yeah, the conjunction. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. So the Klon, um, uh, people are going to lose their mind and see me do this, but I, I adjust it on the fly with my sneaker a lot. So from just a little bit of grit, you know, oh, medium grit. Dimed out. And I'll 
constantly changing pickups. For lead sounds, I mostly like the treble or the neck, mm. you know, some middle stuff sometimes. And like I said, it all depends on, on the song at hand, so. Uh, the Rat is more chunky. As opposed to. Not a whole lot of difference. But sometimes it gets put them together and it gets really noisy, but. Get some nice control feedback. They both get the woman tone, which is sort of important to me. That's the neck pickup with the tone rolled off. So the Klon does it pretty well. The more gain, the better it's going to do it, right? Add the, the rat does it. And both of them. Good for that harmonica, yeah. Becky harmonica. I'll mess with the bar a lot and try to make it sound like slide, you know. Is the compressor always on then? Compressor's pretty much always on, so that's kind of so setting my how hard it's hitting the amp. If I turn it off. Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's see, from there I think we go out, we go to the super shifter, which I primarily use for chorus. Has a nice chorus. And that's where I like to get into the in-between uh, pickup selections, you know, the, these two or these two. You get that nice sparkle. But this, it's, this little pedal does all kinds of stuff. I, I play with a 12-piece uh, Steely Dan band back in Woodstock with Jerry Murata and Rick Murata. have both been playing drums on it, which is phenomenal yeah um, but we do like uh, bodhisattva let's see it's got a smart harmonizer in it there it is so better turn it off quick before you go because you're gonna get well, that sounds pretty cool actually but I've done that I've forgotten to turn it off and I'm playing the song it's like what the, Man, what's like going up on here. yeah <laughs> and it's not always in tune properly but it seems to track pretty well it does uh, for that super the smart let's see one that way magic. one that way gets me back to my chorus and it's got all this weird trim arm detune stuff in it which is fun <laughs> i just like to make it sound drunk you know make the band laugh <laughs> so i think let's see yeah, we're back and uh from there it goes into that little bb sonic stomp which gives the clon kind of like loses some bottom without that. It gives me a lot of bass in, makes mm -hmm. it sound more like a four by 12 cabinet. Yeah. It's more for the sparkly, I think it's supposed to be used more like an exciter, the top end of it. As you know, makes it a lot treblier, but I kind of just point them at each other and leave the, a lot of chunk so that without that. I don't know if that'll translate to the tape, but it gets quite a bit chunkier. What's that? I was gonna say, do you always, is the BBP, the BBE a pedal that kind of always works with another pedal or do you use it by itself sometimes? Uh, it's just on there at the end of the chain. I, it's okay, always on. Help just something to, else. Yeah, okay. uh, before these, I was using a Vibrolux with two tens in mm. it and that really helped it sound fatter yeah. and, and, and nice. So then it's just going to the amp. Most of this other stuff is, you know, aside of being 
cool, hard to find pedals are uh, pretty pedestrian. Yeah. So stuff's on all the time. The digital delay, I kind of just, I'm not messing with that. I just have it set on a pretty quick. Oh yeah. So pretty basic. Yeah. Just a little fast, a little slower than a slap, but just to fatten it up a little bit. Oh, that's still on. Okay. But yeah, you know, all comes from the guitar more than the pedals, it yeah. seems. So I'm, I'm constantly riding volumes, changing tone, uh, master tone switch for all any position on here. This is not a tone knob anymore. And what else? That's about it. I think you got it all. Thank you so much, Jesse. This oh, is, you're uh, welcome. This is beyond what we expected. Got all the sounds. <laughs> Jesse, thank you so oh, much. pleasure. This is Chris Keys for Premier Guitar. Hey everybody, thanks for watching the latest Rig Rundown. Guess what? Every week we upload a brand new rig rundown to premierguitar.com a full week before it's available here on YouTube. So to get your gear fix as soon as humanly possible, go to premierguitar.com forward slash rig rundown. And while you're there, be sure to sign up to get an email notification so you're the first to know as soon as each week's new rig rundown is available. Cheers, see you soon.